Good afternoon, and we are glad to be back. Uh, had a wonderful time on last time as we have been talking about how to live out the Christian life. And on last time, uh, we saw that who we are and what the Lord has made us, that's very precious in the Lord's sight. These bodies, these, these gifts that God has given us, he wants us to use them in sanctification and in honor. Because, because as children of God, our, our, our bodies is the temple of the Lord. So we are to use them for holiness and not uncleanness. And we have to say no. We have to say no. We have the power to say no. We don't want to dishonor God and dishonor our bodies, dishonor the temple that he, 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 the, his spirit lives in. We want to have honor, right? And we, we're not going to let anyone defraud us, smooth talk us, and tell us to do things that we know are wrong. They might say that they are right, but we know they're wrong because the Bible says that they're wrong. And we want to continue in, in looking at the practical walk of Christianity in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, we are at verse uh, 9 this afternoon. So let's go there and let us uh, pick up from where we left off uh, last time. Uh, Paul saying uh, that if anyone had rejected what he was saying about uh, their sanctification and, and about abstaining from sexual immorality and about not letting anyone defraud them because uh, God is the avenger of those, uh, he says that if they reject all of that, they're not rejecting them, but they're rejecting God. And so then he moves on in verse 9, and he says, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And that's one of the things that we know is a sure sign of every child of God. And Jesus told his disciples, he says, that they will know you are mine because you have love for one another. And certainly, as I said, it's all of the time, and I know those of you who have been around me for a while, you, you, you've heard this on several occasions. If God is your father and he's my father, that means that you are my brother and my sister in Christ Jesus, and we ought to love one another, right? not with lip service because love is what it does we ought to love one another so that's what Paul is saying here and he says in verse 10 and indeed you do so toward all the brethren so he says that uh, they're taught by God to love one another he says that these people that he's writing to that they actually do show love toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia he says but we urge you brethren that you increase more and more and more so right so don't don't ever get don't ever get complacent don't ever get settled all right always continue to try to grow always continue to try to have more and more love one for the other he says in verse 11 that you aspire to lead a quiet life as Christians we should all aspire to leave a quiet life right not be caught up in all kinds of stuff not always in this and always in that and always a part of this and always a part of that, all right? A quiet life. Go about life doing what the Lord has called you to do quietly. Lead a quiet life. And notice what he says. To mind your own business, right? Peter says that we are not to be busy bodies in other folk business. Paul right here says that one of the things they need to do is to mind your own business business right don't be dipping in other folks business live as the Lord wants you to live do what the Lord wants you to do don't be so concerned about always trying to figure out about what's going on with someone else just go about doing the business that the Lord has called you to do and notice this he says now and to work with your own hands as we commanded you so then, one of the things that helped folk from being in other folk business, it working, ain't it right? Yeah, going to work and doing what you 
are supposed to do. And even when you're at work and doing what you're supposed to do, make sure that that's what you're doing. Make sure you're not on the job dipping in other folks' stuff. Just do what the Lord has called you to do. Just fulfill the call that is on your life. Just fulfill the mandate is, that is on your life. Just do what you're supposed to be doing, when you're supposed to be doing it, how you're supposed to be doing it, and not worrying about everybody else. Verse 12 says that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing, right? When, 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 when people who are not Christians see those of us who are Christians doing what we do from day to day, they ought to be able to say, they ought to be able to notice that we're living like we're supposed to be living. They ought to be able to see that in us. And that's one of the ways that we reach those who are lost by setting a right example before them. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. All right, so if we want to be sufficient as God would have us to be, we have to strive to live quiet lives minding our own business working and tending to that that the Lord has called us to tend to living in such a way so that when folks see us they can see the Lord God in us as we move day by day that's that's the same thing about Matthew letting your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and Paul says that you may lack nothing right so he wants them to be pure. He wants them to live in love with one another. And he wants their lives to have order, all right? The right kind of order in their lives. Quiet, mind your own business, work with your own hands, all right? Walk properly to those who are outside. So then after he tells them how their lives ought to be pure and how their lives ought to be characterized by brotherly love and an orderly life, then he goes on to comfort them because there were those who had loved ones who were gone on and they were concerned. Remember, the first thing that we talked about on last time was the fact that we have to live our lives with this always on our mind, is that Jesus is coming back again. So Paul tells them how they ought to live, but then he, he has to address another issue. They have to live knowing that the Lord is coming back. That helps them to live their lives right. But then what about the people who've already gone on? And so he has people who are concerned about that. And so in verse 13, as he begins to address that, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. It is concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So he says that if you have loved ones who have fallen asleep. Notice he didn't, he did and, 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 and that's a reference to Christians who have passed on, right? He doesn't say, he says, have fallen asleep because when people sleep, they do what? They wake up, right? He says, lest you sorrow others who have no hope. So see, those of us who have loved ones who have gone on in Christ Jesus, we have hope, right? Now, if they weren't in him, they're in hope, but if they were, there's hope, right? He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do I have a witness? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he says, I don't want you to think that there's no hope for your loved ones who died in Jesus. Because you'll see them again. Because he's going to bring him back with him. Y'all see that? For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who what? Sleep in Jesus. Those who sleep in Jesus get up. That's, that's the hope he's, he's, he's talking about. And then he talks about how this takes place. He says in verse 15, for this, is, for, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So he says, those who have gone on, when the Lord comes, for the ones who, are, who have not gone on and who are still living, he says, we won't go and be with the Lord before them. We're not going to beat them going to be with the Lord. Right? We're not going to go before them. We're not going to leave them behind. That's what he's trying to say. 
And so he goes on in verse 16 and says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The Lord is coming. He's coming from heaven. He's going to shout. The shout is going to be with the voice of an archangel. And that will be the sound of the trump, trumpet of God. All that happens, guess what he says? And the dead in Christ will rise first. Right? He said, don't worry about leaving those who have already gone on behind. He says, because when the Lord come from heaven with the shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, he said, they're going to get up first. Do I have witness now? They're going to rise first. They're going to rise first. I'm not going to leave them behind because they're going to rise first, he says. He says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Y'all see this now. Together. They go first. We caught up together with them. Dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <laughs> and thus we shall always be with the Lord Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So he's comforting them. It's going to be all right. Yes, they're going on before you, but you're not going to meet them. You're not going to uh, uh, beat them getting to glory with God the Father, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to be caught up there together. All right? Now, so he talks about that. He tells them that. He gives them comfort so they won't have to worry about their, their loved ones who have gone on before them being left out of the, com of the day of the Lord when he comes back. Now, so what I want to do briefly, though, I, I want us to go to uh, 1 Corinthians. I want us, uh, that kind of talks, uh, gives us a, 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 a little bit more information on, on what that's all about, uh, the coming of the Lord, that, that, that change that he's talking about, uh, about them. Uh, about the dead in Christ rising. Uh, so let's, let's get a little bit on that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, we we'll to start at verse uh, 35. Let's, 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 let's get a, a, a different perspective on, on, on what he was talking about. Dead in Christ rising first and those of us who are alive remain being called up together to meet him in the air. Watch this now. Uh, Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, chapter 15, verse 35, says, But someone will say, right? And maybe some of you are saying the same thing, right? As we just been talking about the dead being raised, right? He says, But some of you will say, How are the dead raised up? How'd they get up? Right? And, and, what, and, and with what body do they come? Some folk ask that, wouldn't they? Some of y'all are asking the same question now, right? <laughs> so Paul says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed his own body. So what he's saying is, and... Uh, For a lot of us country people, we, 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 we're familiar with this. Some, some of our more, more city-inclined people might not know as much, but when you plant corn, amen, you dig the hole and you maybe take a couple of kernels and you put it in the hole and, and you cover it up. You plant it the corn. But the kernels that you put in the ground those kernels are not what comes up. Do I have a witness? <laughs> right? They're in there. They're dead, right? They're going to produce something else that comes up. It's like it, but it's not the same thing. Them grains of corn that you put in there, you won't get those. You're going to get, some, you're going to get something new. All right? So that's what he's saying. He says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, right? What you put in, it, that's not what's coming up. Do I have a witness? 
That, that, that's what he's saying. You do not sow that body that shall be. It's going to be, a, you sow in this body, but the body that's going to come up is going to be a different body. That's what he's saying. So then look at verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but one, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another flesh of fish, and another of birds. That's right. So what you get depends on the type of flesh that we're dealing with. He says there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Right? Remember he says that, that go back up to verse uh, 30, 38, he says, but God gives it a body as he would. Please, so, so when, when whatever goes down, God going to give a body that he wants to give you. Do I have a witness now, right? So then, he says, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Watch this. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The body that is sown is this body that can have stuff go wrong with it. And stuff is wrong with it. But he says it is raised in what? Incorruption. It is raised a body that has nothing that's wrong with it and ain't nothing going to go wrong with it. Do I have witness now? <laughs> right? He says it is sown in dishonor. Things have taken place with this one that shouldn't have taken place. Do I have witness now? It is raised in what? Glory. When it is raised, nothing, not, not, nothing has been tainted. All is good. All is pure. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. This, 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 this clay pot can only take so much. Sown in weakness. It is raised in what? Power. Isn't that good news? It is sown a natural body, right? What, what you see here is natural. It is raised, see that? What's raised is different, right? Because it is sown a natural body, but it is raised what kind? A spiritual body. And they're not the same. Look what he says. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, right? And God created, right? The last man, Adam, that, that's Jesus, became a life-giving what? Spirit. So those of Adam, everybody, what you have, a living being. Those of Jesus, spirit, right? Life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first. You don't get that first. But the natural, right? What comes first? The natural. We have this first. And after what? what? The spiritual. The first man was of the earth, right? Come of the earth. Made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The first man, Adam, he came from the dirt. Jesus, he comes from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. Because we all come from Adam, come from dust. Do I have witness now? And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Those of us who are in him, just like we were like Adam in the earthly, we're going to be like him in the heavenly. Do I have a witness? And so, and as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we all came here like Adam. But those of us who are in Christ Jesus, do I have a witness? Look at this now. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. It's going to be like him. Right? That's what he's talking about. Now, this I said, brethren, it is now, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember, remember Paul in, in, in Thessalonians, he was talking about uh, there were some who had fallen asleep, right? He says, but there are going to be some who still are alive and remain until the coming of the day of the Lord. Do I have a witness now? He says, we shall not all sleep. Remember, some of them sleeping in Christ, some wasn't. Some, some weren't. He says, but we shall all be what? Changed. All going to be changed. Remember, the dead in Christ rise first, and then the other ones were what? Caught up in the air to meet the Lord, right? Change. But it happens so quickly. Do I have a witness? Look at that verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, before you can bat your eye, <laughs> At the last trump, for the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised. Y'all see this? Incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Isn't that good news? For this corruptible 
it must put on incorruption. It's going to be different and it's going to be better. <laughs> and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's why Jesus said, if any man die in, 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 in Christ, yet shall he also live. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Death does not have a sting. Death does not have a victory for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul was trying to tell them. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Here it is, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory is that we get up. <laughs> we rise forever and forevermore. And because we know that no matter what we deal with down here, no matter what we have to go through, that one day God is going to take this that we have and he's going to conform it to his image, that we will no longer have the earthly, we will have the heavenly, that we will no longer have the natural, we will have the spiritual. That day is coming for those of us who are his. So we have some good motivation. That's why he says in verse 58, the last verse of this chapter, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be what? Steadfast. Isn't that right? Immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. With all that good stuff that we just talked about that God has for those of us who are his, every time we turn around, do I have a witness now? We're going to be steadfast. We're going to be immovable. We're going to always be trying to do what the Lord has called us to do because we know if we do that, that there's a reward in the end, and our labor in him is not in vain. So that gives us a little deeper look at what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4. As we go back there, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together, it was better explained than Corinthians, right, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words, right? We all should be comforted by those words. One day the Lord will make it all all right. And so then Paul, as he continues to exhort these Christians at the church at Thessalonica about their practical living, their practical Christian lives. We go on to chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The Lord is coming back, right? Remember, that's our main motivation for living right and, and doing what the Lord has called us to do. The day comes. Paul has already talked about the day of the Lord and uh, those who are dead in Christ ra being raised first and then those who are alive and remain being caught together to meet him in the air. We looked at 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and talked about how what that change is about in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And so then he says now that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So, so he is want, wanting them to be ready for that day, but it comes as a thief in the night. In other words, the day comes unexpectedly. And verse 3 lets us know how unexpectedly it comes because it says, for when they say peace and safety, when everybody thinks everything's fine, that nothing wrong and life is good, he says, then sudden destruction comes upon them. When they're having a good time, enjoying, living life, living it up, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, sharp and strong and, and swift and quick. And because it comes upon them when they're not ready for it, it says, and they shall not escape. Right? 
that's the people of the world. And I, I remember explaining this to, uh, to the church the other Sunday. But now here's the good part in verse 4 about those of us who are his, right? Notice that he's writing to the saints, and notice what he tells them. He says, but you, right, brethren, are not in darkness, right? Look, what, watch what he says now. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief, right? The day comes as a thief, right? It comes unexpectedly, right? But the children of God, it doesn't overtake us like a thief. Isn't that wonderful news? Yeah. Because we are not in, in darkness. We're not blinded. We're not unaware. He says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, right? He says, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, right? So as we live our lives down here as Christians, we need to be paying attention to what's going on. We, he says that we need to watch and be sober. In other words, we need to keep our minds together. We need to pay attention to the things that are going on around us, the signs of the times. Understand the Bible says what the will of the Lord is. Understanding what's going on, what does the Lord require. Study the word so that the eyes of your enlightenment might be opened up. See what's going on. He says, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Those are people who are, who are, who are, who are just living carelessly, aimlessly, without any thought that the end might be near. That's why it catches them off guard, he says, and we'll pick up on next time. May God bless you. May God keep you. Amen.